Welcome to today's dialogue. This is sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, and it's called Revolution at the Ballot Box. And this is something which we've just uh, been through. My name is Sandy Perry. I'm a co-moderator. Uh, my other co-moderator, Fatima Garcia, is going to be coming on um, a little bit later in the program. Um, I have been organizing side by side with tenants and unhoused people for 30 years in San Jose, California. And I'm currently a volunteer with Chan Deliverance Ministry, Affordable Housing Network, and South Bay Community Land Trust. Um, I just wanted to introduce this dialogue. Lerna, the League of Revolutionaries for New America, decided to um, sponsor this dialogue to give people a chance to assess the recent election campaigns that we've been through. And uh, one of the, uh, you may have noticed, one of the first things that uh, uh, the mainstream media, first of all, the mainstream media said, as the election was going on, said, you're all doomed. You're gonna, the corporate overlords are gonna win. You might as well not even vote. Uh, and when that didn't work, because especially the youth turned out in record numbers, and we almost uh, uh, surpassed the record vote in of, 20, of the 2018 midterms. When that didn't work, after uh, the uh, what you would only what you'd have to call the fascist offensive that was going on during the elections, after that was temporarily diverted or temporarily turned back. Um, what happened was the media started saying, oh, well, now you don't have to worry, we're all back to normal, which was another lie, because we're not, we're not. Anybody who looked at the victories of DeSantis in Florida, uh, Greg, Greg Abbott in Texas, Brian Kemp in Georgia, these are not nice people. And just because some of them don't get along with Trump very well, doesn't mean that they're uh, any less uh, in favor of a corporate dictatorship. Uh, than Donald Trump. And in fact, uh, the danger remains extremely high. And you also, you have to look at how they won. They won because they enacted voter suppression laws, uh, not only in their states, but they helped enact them all across the South. So this is not a return to normal. However, there was just uh, some tremendous uh, uh, victories that were achieved during this electoral uh, period. First of all was the involvement of the youth which was huge and is transforming the whole uh, face of the uh, electorate. And second of all, we uh, five different states rejected anti-abortion policies in referendums. And in fact, uh, almost everywhere a referendum showed up on the ballot uh, that had to do with basic human needs and basic human rights. It was supported by the voters. Uh, and it was supported by even by voters that voted for candidates that many of us don't like and don't respect. Um, and uh, one of the things that became really clear during the election was that this was really, uh, it was about more than just a vote. It was a battle of ideas. And I remember one of my friends one time told me, if you don't think elections are important, just ask yourself, why does the ruling class spend $16 billion during elections? And a lot of it is, is not even what candidates they're fighting for. A lot of it is the kind of policies they're fighting for. And actually the, probably the most uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, prevailing uh, ideas that came out during the campaign, the most vicious idea, were uh, ideas that the media and the ruling class promoted around what is crime. And they, first of all, they deliberately confused it with Democrats saying that Democrats were soft on crime, even though everybody knows that red states actually have higher crime rates than uh, blue states. Uh, but even more uh, disturbingly, they, proposed basically the old Ku Klux Klan uh, idea is that crime is something that is done by people of color. And it's, it's obviously that was the centerpiece of Trump's uh, 
campaign in his administration for the last several years, and it's still the centerpiece of ideology. So um, basically, what we're talking about here is uh, this is still an extremely dangerous situation, but the victories of progressive candidates in cities all across the country, the expansion of the squad from, I, I heard different numbers and it changes back and forth depending when the vote count is completed, but there were uh, at least four new squad members were added and uh, possibly more by the time all the votes are in. Um, a tremendous expansion of candidates winning in city councils and and even I uh, just heard yesterday, uh, the mayor of Oakland is gonna be a progressive. So there's a uh, tremendous victories and this creates opportunities for all of our issues. And if you look at the people that we have on our panels today, almost all of them have been asked, uh, active in the issues around housing and homelessness. And that's certainly in California, that's one of the major issues alongside other uh, obviously critical social issues all across the country, including the uh, reproductive freedom issue, which was on the ballot in so many states. So I wanna welcome everybody and uh, we're gonna move on to, our, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna move on to our panelists. So uh, I'm gonna ask if uh, uh, Carol Fife is on is on the line yet? Carol Fife is a council member for Oakland's District Three. After decades of public service as a community organizer, Carol was called to run for office by the people with whom she organizes every day. One of the founding members of Moms for Housing, Carol has fought both in the halls of power and in the streets to protect the human right to house. As a council member. Her priorities are to divest from police, to invest in the community, get every unsheltered person in Oakland into housing as quickly as possible, and create progressive tax structures to correct social and racial inequities. Her historic winning campaign, supported by virtually every endorsing organization in Oakland, was powered by over a thousand active volunteers and has transitioned into a permanent political organization dedicated to passing transformative legislation and bring, bringing a progressive majority to the o Oakland City Council. And I'd just like to add, it appears that she has accomplished that last part. So thank you. Please welcome Carol Fife. <laughs> good afternoon. It is really good to see uh, familiar faces here. Um, I do want to apologize before I, I, I start. I'm not feeling uh, terribly well. Um, so please forgive me and my voice. I might also sneeze a couple of times while I'm speaking, but um, I just want to express how grateful I am to be with you all because I'm always, I'm always inspired by the words that I hear and the, the fact that folks are still organizing and putting on these forms for the public is just, uh, such a critical part of what we need. The political education is such a critical part of what we need and the analysis, because without the proper analysis, we can do all sorts of things. But um, yeah, once again, just happy. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Ethel, for continuously letting me know what was, what was going on. Um, that said, oh uh, yeah, they tried it in the elections. They tried it. And not just in, you know, throughout the country, but in Oakland, there was this fear mongering around um, progressives and um, certain individuals taking over city council. And that being as a result of why this, the city is in the condition that it's in, not civil colonialism, not late stage capitalism, or any of the other things that we know are, are uh, at the root cause of creating uh, harm in the first place to people's individual and spe specific lives. But what that does collectively when generation after generation, people have been uh, oppressed or um, just targeted for 
for, um, you know, attention by the state when you are an antisocial being. And a lot of people fit into that category, poor people, black people, brown people, queer people. There's a, the list goes on, but the, the election results in the city of Oakland spoke volumes and it was much, much louder than the rhetoric um, saying that defund was the default uh, or, or the, the fault of certain council members who wanted to take the anarchist, socialist, communist government in Oakland. But what progressives said with their votes is that we will continue to organize for the representatives that have a vision of a future that includes all people um, on the spectrum. And that's, that was said very clearly that the housing measures, all of which I was a part of, you either drafting independently or drafting in collaboration with city staff and other elected officials that I were with. And so the first of that list was Measure Q. And Measure Q was simply the authorization to get Oakland voters to say yes or no to development of low income units in the city of Oakland. And uh, I, I hope it was uh, readily present or prevalent or observable that despite not having uh, a summary in the ballot book for Oakland voters, um, because, ooh, that was a story. It was, I think it was the day after, well, I don't wanna um, disparage the clerks because they are doing their job, but when we went to turn in the ballot, um, the ballot summary, um, they said that all of the supporting uh, letters had to be on letterhead from the individuals that had statements. And I just thought they had to be like written on a regular piece of paper, but I was told that they had to be written on letterhead. And so despite um, not having that statement in the ballot book for Measure Q, Oakland voters passed it by, last time I checked, nearly 80%. Despite the, the uh, tax association's negative summary that was an outright bold faced lie in their summary arguing against Measure Q authorizing 13,000 affordable units, it still passed. Checked and I think it was at 79% or so. Um, I should probably pull up the results. So I can. And so what that does is authorize um, uh, the construction develop, uh, acquisition of uh, 13,000 13, social housing units. And you all know that housing is one of my biggest issues as an elected official and, and before as a director of a, a, an organization that primarily focused on housing for um, low income marginalized people. And um, 13,000 units does not mean all of a sudden we have the, the funding to develop these projects, but we just get the voters authorization because Article 34 in the Constitution requires permission of voters of any municipal affair to, um, to develop these units. And this was created based on the 1950s law that uh, was a reaction to desegregation. And so this is a relic of a law. And in 2024, Californians all over the state will have the opportunity to repeal it completely from the California Constitution. So I'll back in 2024, urging everyone to support the initiative to completely take that out of the California Constitution. No other state in the union has a, a development law on the books like that. But I said, once again, that this housing measure did not create the funding to develop those uh, 13,000 units. So one of the things that I promised to my um, supporters and folks who put me in office was to find a funding mechanism to develop affordable housing. And that was Measure U. So Measure U will authorize a um, funding of $850,000, $850 million of, of fund funding to develop the projects that we authorize through Measure Q and other sources. And just to put it in context, um, this, is a, this is a general obligation bond. And 
we originally authorized it in 2017 through Measure KK. And so this is just a continuation of that, that bond. And we were able to create a fund called the Preservation of Affordable Housing Fund. And um, that has allowed several Oakland families to take their houses permanently off the speculative market through the use of these monies and um, put those homes in a community land trust, specifically the Oakland Community Land Trust. So I, ha I have experience, personal experience with working with ACE, the Alliance of Californians uh, for Community Empowerment as the director there to create this fund. And I know this is a housing measure that has saved people's lives. It's kept them out of homelessness and other things. And I expect this, this measure to do the same. And the final measure, um, I'm so sorry, I, I uh, got a little carried away with Measure Q. Um, the, the final measure that I was a part of working with Dan called to put in front of the city council and get authorized to be on the ballot was measure, measure V. And that is expanding eviction protections to people um, that are a part of the Oakland Unified School District during the school year. So now in Oakland, well, not just now, but we have eviction protection, some of the strongest in the nation for Oakland's tenants. And this expands it to um, teachers, families, people who work in Oakland public schools to not experience evictions during the school year. Everyone knows what that does to families and children um, and staff because housing is a human right or it should be a human right. And we're on our path to making that legal in the city of Oakland and Measure V gets us that much closer because it also protects people that are on private property who live in mobile units and recreational vehicles as well. So um, I know I only had a few uh, minutes to talk about these, these measures, but that was Q, U, and V. Those are the housing measures that will help point us in the right direction. But now it's about implementation and oversight. Because once again, I just, um, I sponsored a report to come through the city of Oakland to determine how much we spend on homelessness on a regular basis. And it's upwards of $75 million, but we need to make sure that that $70 million a year that we spend goes in the right place. Just like all of these ballot measures have to make, we have to make sure that they are um, implemented appropriately. And with this incoming council, I'm more confident than I've ever been in Oakland city politics that we can get some things done. Ashe, Ashe O, thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And we're, we'll have a, a chance to have a discussion uh, with other panelists and people from the participants from the audience uh, in a couple of minutes. But right now, I want to introduce the next panelist. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Crystal Sanchez, who was the current Western Regional Director for the National Union of the Homeless and President of the Sacramento Homeless Union, was unable to join us today due to the threat of being evicted. Uh, and actually, we're going to post a GoFundMe link in the chat for people who may be able to assist Crystal. And actually, our next panelist is also in danger of being evicted. 